Hi, welcome to this awesome book. Thanks for coming. Uh, we're really excited today to have uh, Dorothy Bradley and Tom Tao. And uh, I, you know, I, I finished reading this book and I, I, it greatly exceeded my expectations. It's just a terrific book. Um, you read it. I did. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, I remember the time uh, that, that you were talking about in the book uh, very well. It was a very exciting time in Montana, you know, uh, uh, just about the time we get our new constitution and then that first couple of legislatures that met right after that. And, you know, this uh, exciting, dynamic woman comes out of Bozeman, you know, who was. <laughs> Just make it big waves. And, you know, Twenty-two. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And Tom Tao, they're uh, you know just uh, you know solving amazing problems. I mean, it's you know it is only fifty years ago now that this happened. But on the other hand, the the impact is so big that uh, well, I couldn't be more excited. So I'm just going to turn it over to you guys. Just get out of your way, and we'll get on with it. Okay. Well, Dorothy, why don't you tell a little bit about how this book came about? I can't believe I'm so lucky to sit up here with Tom. Because the reason the book came about is a couple of years ago, I mean, this is really true, someone said to me, can you tell me what the cold trust is? <laughs> I mean, I, I couldn't believe it. It was like a couple of years before that, someone had said, what got you involved in politics? And I said, Earth Day. And they said, Earth Day. And I thought, oh my God. <laughs> my Earth Day was 30 years before they were born. <laughs> but it brought home, that comment brought home the fact that this is all becoming history. Except nobody knows about it. And I wanted to make sure it left its mark for a number of reasons. It was... Um, an amazing decade, sometimes called glory days, golden years, earth decade, all kinds of things. And I've asked myself any number of times, how did that happen? How did all the stars line up? And uh, the stars really did line up. And I have always been lucky to be there at the right time. The stars line up. It is a matter of luck when you're able to get plugged into the system. But I can remember, I mean, just for a, the briefest example, the things that inspired me and inspired everybody. Aldo Leopold, Leopold gave us a land ethic. Uh, Joseph Kinsey Howard told us about how Montana, you know, the great historian, High, White, and Handsome, how Montana was so abused by out-of-state corporations. Wallace Stigner told us how the West was a fragile, dry area. And then along came Gaylord Nelson, who had the brilliance of having a nationwide Earth Day, which meant that all those little groups out there were suddenly tied together. You might have been fighting for a river here, or tobacco here, or pesticides here, and, the, and then suddenly they all came together. And it was, it was a, a national unified movement. And I was so lucky to be right at the cusp of the wave. Uh, we, we organized the first Earth Day at MSU in Bozeman. And it had huge participation, students and the community. And it was like a, a huge day and evening event and nobody ever left. I mean, you could tell this is something new. And that was my piece of luck because that led to my, I was thinking about going to graduate school and wondering what in the world I was going to do with my life, but that led me into a legislative race. And that led me into the decade of the 70s. At the end of it all, you know, I don't know how movements wind up. I can see how they get started. I'm not so sure how they wind up. Because we're sort of at a standoff right now when it comes to the environment. It just seems like we're at loggerheads and we just butt heads. And But there was an incredible moment there that was pretty magical. 
And so suddenly when I saw somebody didn't know what the cold trust was, I thought we've got to, we've got to memorialize this decade. But I am no historian and I did not want, nor did Chuck Johnson want to write a historic tome of what was going on. And I didn't want a history anyway. I wanted stories from the people that were there. That's what I wanted. I wanted their stories because I love my own stories. And I was able to find 20 of them. And it took an awful lot of prodding and cajoling to, to bring these stories out. But I said, we're going to collect these and put them into a unit. And pretty soon they started trickling in. And the stories were remarkable. When you look at what we did in that decade, I mean, it was the coal tax, the coal trust, strip mine reclamation, hard rock reclamation, scenic rivers, water use, uh, stream access, the new constitution, and then all the laws that implemented the new constitution. It was just absolutely mind blowing. And so that's what this collection is. I was not turned down by anybody I had a couple of difficulties not being able to reach people that are sorely left out and a couple of people who are deceased that are sorely left out. But um, the stories would start coming to me and I would, some I didn't need to edit at all, like Tom. <laughs> some were disastrous but beautiful stories like Harrison Fagg when he told me about his, his he so wanted to be here and I'm so sorry he's not because his urging kept me going on this but when he told me about going up in the Beartooth and finding how they'd ripped up a piece of the meadow there um, it was just an, an, an incredible story and uh, Harrison is a fabulous architect and businessman he's not really a writer it must have taken me two weeks to edit his three-page story that's the way his legislation was when he came over to me <laughs> <laughs> did the same thing and, and I remember sending it back he said wow you're a really good editor I, I can't tell the difference <laughs> well that's good <laughs> and uh, oh I I, I don't know if I'd have done this without his encouragement. He is such an incredible man. And when he had that hard rock mining legislation, his vision was this is going to be bipartisan, by golly, and I was his first co-signer. I mean, when have you heard anything like that in the last 10 years? So uh, the stories would come in, and I was very lucky because they came in bit by bit, and I'd edit them, and then I'd send them out to all the 20 writers. And everybody would cheer, and they'd send back comments, and then everybody had wonderful memories of what we were doing then. And, uh, and then just to, to wind it up, we were really lucky. I have a f very close friend who is the professor of land and water at the law school, and she, I said, I don't know what I'm going to do with these. And she said, why don't I have a law review? Now, she turned it over to the law students because a law review is law students. And I remember saying to the incredible lead editor, Dan Bristol, oh, he's so wonderful to work with. I said, I can't believe we're so lucky to work with a bunch of law students. Why would you do this? And he said, law review? These are all the laws we've lived with all these years. Of course we do this. What an opportunity. And uh, the only downside at all is that uh, it's an expensive thing to purchase, and I know that. But if you ever just want to read it and not purchase it, with some contributions, we made sure it's in every library. And I think the only other thing I'll say, oh, I have to tell a Tom Tao story. <laughs> that means I get to tell one of you. You can tell me anything you want. <laughs> no. I couldn't believe Tom's stories. And, and he's got two in there. In fact, one of the fellow writers said, how come Tom gets two? Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's got twice as much to say. <laughs> but um, the detail, particularly of his scheming to move every progressive from the House into the Senate and put them in key <laughs> positions of the, of the committees and then having committees be here and there and you know, and secret and not so secret. Oh, it's just a, an incredible intrigue. 
but I just couldn't believe the detail. It just made me ill that I don't have a brain like that. But I did say at some point, I just, Tom, I'm just so overwhelmed by your memory. I mean, I always have been, but you're, I mean, this is just, this is just minute detail. He said, oh, Dorothy, I dictated while I went back and forth between Helena and Billings. Every weekend I was so captivated by the, everything that was going around, on that I just dictated into my dictaphone and I thought, well, that makes me feel a little bit better. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> but then I just wanted to say a word about the, the title because I love our title. That's what I hope captivates people. Um, you know, we all love the our favorite phrase, an overused phrase, the last best place. Frankly, I'm getting sick of it. We wanted this to reflect what was at our root of what we were trying to do, what was, what was enabling us, what was inspiring us. And of course, that's to make a better place. So thank goodness we found the name that reflected that. Well, thank you, Dorothy. That was kind of you. Um, well, I was delighted when Dorothy contacted me because I was in the process of trying to figure out how to write the history of the coal tax, and uh, she prompted me to get it done, and I did. <laughs> and uh, I'm glad you did. And I, I have great aspirations to do more. But uh, this was a really, op a really great opportunity. I have to start out, though, by telling you that when I first got elected to the legislature, um, there was one woman in the legislature. <laughs> and that was you. <laughs> no, it was in the House. Yeah, uh, there was another woman. Tony Roselle was in the Senate. Tony Roselle was in the Senate. But uh, so, so we both started at the same time, exact same time in the legislature. That's when I first met you. Um, and, and the story, and by the way, this, uh, if you don't know this, you should, and that is that the, the Humanities, the Commission for Humanities in Montana awarded Dorothy the Humanitarian Award for the year this last, well, it was just a couple weeks ago. Um, and and I, was, uh, I was asked to make a little preview on a, a little statement, and I did. And, but they cut it off. They, they just used a little teeny bit of it. <laughs> and, and one of the stories that I did make is that, uh, you know, those people in the legislature at that time they were kind of a lot different than people are right now. And they were always looking for something, I guess, that was different and unique. And obviously, Dorothy was unique. Well, the way we, as a lady, she was. But the way we uh, ask someone if they will uh, uh, answer a question on the floor is, will the lady or will the gentleman Lee uh, yield? Will the gentleman yield for a question? Well, I guess I forgot to ask to add that for a question, and I stood up and asked if uh, Dorothy Bradley would yield. <laughs> Everybody laughed, and I thought, "Oh, what that was." <laughs> At any rate, uh, the I wanted to give you a little bit of a snippet, perhaps, of one of the issues that are in that's in the book. The 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 one thing that I think kind of helps formulate, helps people get an idea of what was going on and how it was happening uh, is the 1975 Senate Democratic Caucus. That's really unique uh, because of several very unique things and also because I was involved. It was unique for me, of course. Uh, but the uh, a number of us, this was, I, I had served two sessions, three sessions actually, with the annual session in 74 uh, of the legislature, and I had produced quite a few bills on some really important things. The coal tax was one, uh, utility, bill, utility legislation, uh, eliminating the fair value bill, the fair value 
uh, you so little. underrate yourself. It was yeah. huge. At <laughs> any rate, that was another one, and there were quite a few others. We, I got them through the House, and I went over to the Senate, and the Democrats had a 30 to 20 majority in the Senate, and they got killed. <laughs> Those old fuddy-duddies in the Senate <laughs> killed my bills. <laughs> and I Everybody found out that I wasn't the only one. There were a whole bunch of legislators in the House that felt the same way. So we all ran for the Senate. <laughs> Eleven of us got elected in 19, well that would be 1974 for the 1975 session. Well, we, uh, a, a couple of us got together. I, I was communicating with Larry Fossbender, and I also was communicating with Bob Watt from Missoula, Larry Fossbender from Fort Shaw, really close to Great Falls. and. Uh, you know, I said, I think we ought to get together and organize a little bit because I think we, we may be able to do something s significant here. And maybe if we just a few of us got together before the caucus, uh, before the actual caucus on Saturday, uh, was in November, I guess, uh, where we would elect all the leaders and all that type of thing formally, we ought to get together and talk about it a little bit and see if we couldn't uh, do a little extra, do a little extra, make sure that we were heard. And, and one of the things that I suggested, and I think some others suggested too, was, you know, what we need to do is we need, to, we need to get not necessarily in the leadership so much as in the chairs of the committees. That's where the action is. And if we were chair, if we had chairs of the committees that were on our side, that were doing things uh, and to make a difference progressively, that would be really helpful. So with that in mind, we decided I had a key to the taxation committee room on the fourth floor of the Capitol building. And, and I said, let's meet there Friday afternoon before the uh, Friday evening, before the caucus on Saturday. And I was, I was aghast when I walked into the room. All but nine of the 30 Democratic senators were there. <laughs> They had heard about it, and they weren't about to let this go by without talking about it. And so, okay, we said, you know, we want to make sure there's a bunch of us, and in addition to the 11 Democratic senators, Democratic Democrats from the House that had won the Senate seat, there were five people from uh, the Constitutional Convention of 74 that also ran, and also joined as Democrats. People like Chet Blaylock, uh, Margaret Warden, uh, Don Foster from Lewistown, and a number of, uh, five of them all together, including Miles Romney. And Miles Romney was really unique because he had served earlier in the House, and he also had been appointed to fill a vacancy uh, in the Senate. So Tell at that who time, Miles Romney was. Okay, Ro Miles Romney is one of one of Montana's greatest. I think he was a newspaper. He ran the uh, the newspaper. No, it wasn't the People's Voice. He was no. a but in River in uh, uh, Valley County in in uh, mm -hmm. the, the Hamilton. Hamilton, and and his father was a newspaper editor, and he was a newspaper editor, and he struggled along making a living on a newspaper in a little, in a little town like Hamilton. But <laughs> he was a great, great person involved in so many things, so much of the Democratic Party, so much of the progressive activity of all sorts of things, not just the environment, but all sorts of progressive things. So he was, he was right with us. There was no question about that. Uh, so then there were three, there were, I think three other Democrats that uh, uh, new Sen Democratic senators that had no prior experience. I talked to all, I think there were five all together were elected and, and I, I uh, gave up on John Manley and I gave up on one other person, but there were three of them. I thought we would probably get their votes. So when we added all that up, it was 19 votes and there were only 30 Democrats so we had a pretty strong majority of the Democrats. So we pointed that out and said, you know, we want, 
we want to make sure that that some of these really important committees have one of us as chairman. And Dave Manning looked at us and said, oh, you're going too fast. That's not right. You, you can't be a chairman. You're only a freshman. <laughs> and we said, well, we want to do that. <laughs> and uh, it went on for quite a while. Finally, uh, 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 Neil Lynch, who was the majority leader previously, and was uh, we had agreed that he would go, he would go ahead and be a majority leader this time. We would go ahead and support Gordon McCumber. He was from Butte. Yep. Yeah, Neil Lynch was from Butte. Gordon McCumber was a farmer. I don't even remember where, he, but he, he was he had a lot of support. At any rate, we said fine, but we want the chairman of all of these committees, the taxation committee. Judiciary Committee, the Education Committee, the State Administration Committee, the, uh, uh, I think there were eight different committees. We said, we want to be chairman. And uh, then I, uh, several of them, besides Dave Manning, who was from Forsyth, and the longest living, uh, uh, I mean, longest term uh, legislator in the United States. He served for over 50 years as a legislator in the state of Montana uh, continuously. So he was, he said, oh, he was just really upset that just, you know, you, you're way, you're, you're destroying all the, the seniority concepts that we have. You can't do that. And we said, well, let's, let's see what we can do. And Neil Lynch started going down through the chairman and they, they agreed that uh, Bob Watt would be chairman of the taxation committee. They agreed. I would be cha chairman of judiciary, and they agreed. And I and uh, and then uh, Mike Greeley was going to be chairman of the state administration committee. And uh, 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 then we got then we got to uh, business and industry. And Pat Regan was our choice for uh, chairman of that committee. And uh, uh, oh, uh, uh, let's see, what was his name? Uh, uh, the car dealer from Great Falls who uh, said, oh, well, I'm really uh, very much a businessman and I need, I, I've been in the legislature for four years and I've never been a chairman of any committee and I think I should be, and I've been in the Senate for four years and I should be. And uh, they went, <laughs> uh, Pat, well, no, well, that was when Dave Manning looked at her and said, now Pat, I think you're going too fast. Why don't you just be chair, vice chairman? Pat said, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> so we, went, we decided to uh, ask some questions. And, uh, and I started asking, uh, what was his name again? Uh, from Great Falls, at any rate, I asked him a couple questions. I said, well. I see his face, but I can't. Uh, well, it's, it's coming. It'll come to me. At any rate, I asked him, "Well, how did you vote on utility bills?" And I, of course, I knew exactly how he voted on all of you, all of my utility bills. And he said, "Well, I, I kind of like some of your bills." <laughs> I said, "You didn't vote for them, did you?" And and how about? And we went through a few other things. And uh, obviously, he was not going to be the person we wanted for that committee chairman. Uh, and then we went on to education. That was one of the really charming ones. Uh, uh, Boylan. Uh, Paul Boylan. Paul, Paul Boylan was, uh, he had been served several sessions in the House. He'd served in the Senate. And he said, I've never been chairman of a committee. And, and I really think I ought to be the chairman of the education committee. And uh, Chet Blaylock, uh, you know, I was watching Chet about that time, and, and I know Chet pretty well. And I was a, I was a little bit worried because he's kind of said, he was about to the point to where he was going to say, well, yeah, maybe you go ahead and, and I'll let you do that. And I mean, that's just the way Chet is. He's, he was a little too quick to compromise sometimes. <laughs> and then uh, somebody asked him, well, uh, oh, and then, no, Paul Boylan started out as saying, well, the other reason I'm really interested in is because I've been on the school board, and 
and I uh, and I've been going to all the meetings that the school board association has had, and I know what their their concerns are, and I can really represent that. And wow, did that ever <laughs> that ever flip? Because right at that point well, there was a lot of concern about collective bargaining for teachers, and and they asked him, well, did you support the teachers' bill? Well, no. And did you support this bill? Uh, um, Funding more more money for education? Well, no. Uh, did you support this one? Did you support this one? Did you support this one? No, no, no. <laughs> and that was it. Check would have never given up after that. <laughs> In any event, uh, we went on. Uh, and we ended up with eight of the committee chairmanships. And uh, they got the chair, the president and the majority leader. And, and that's, that's how we handled it. Um, they also, of course, had to choose the committee on committees. At, in the Senate, unlike the House, in the House, the Speaker of the House chooses all the committees and all the people who are serving on the committees. In the Senate, it's a committee that does that, the committee on committees. So it was, it was pretty well organized, pretty well agreed that, that I was supposed to be one, one of the three members of the committee on committees. And, um, uh, I'm not good at names, and I can't remember now the fellow from the Lodge Grass, um, uh, Graham, Carol Graham. Carol Graham was doing great. <laughs> he, he was uh, on the committee. He was he was going to be on the committee on committees, and then we had to appoint a third person, and we of course wanted one of us, and they kind of agreed to that, and we proposed Miles Romney, <laughs> and that was pretty good because he was already in the Senate. He wasn't one of those young guys that always is bothering him, you know, bringing all these new things in. So he let that happen, and, and uh, the three of us were on the committee on committees. Well, they named me as chairman right away, and, and then and Miles said, well, you just go figure it out, and I'll sign it. <laughs> Don't worry about it. <laughs> and I did. <laughs> and and uh, there were a number of things that I did, but most of them, uh, uh, the, the thing that just really bothered me the most, I think, about working and dealing with the Senate when I was in the House, is that when I'd get a bill into the Senate, that would be scheduled for a hearing, and you'd go to a hearing, and I didn't have a quorum. They didn't have a quorum because the senators were all serving on committees that met at the same time. Nobody tried to figure out how to make sure that they all had uh, an opportunity to go to a meeting without having to be in another committee. So as soon and then pretty soon they'd, somebody would finally walk in and they'd have a quorum and then about that time somebody else would walk out and that was frustrating. So I made sure that absolutely no senator had to serve on two, sub, two committees that met at the same time because I could, I could also di dictate when the committee meetings were going to be. And I also reduced the size of the committees. So with no more than eight people served on any committee except for the taxation and, and the state and the uh, appropriations committees. So that worked out, well, I made one mistake, but other than one person, everybody was free and didn't have committees that met at the same time. But more importantly, I also was appointing who was on the committees. Well, the Republicans, uh, uh, let's see, the minority leader at that time was the gentleman from Dillon, and what was his name? I can't remember. Anyway, uh, he he Hazel presented. Hazel Baker. Yes, ba Hazel Baker. Hazel Baker. Hazel. Frank Hazel Baker from wow. Dillon, and uh, and he was he presented his list of all the Republicans and how he wanted them, <laughs> and I didn't like him terribly well either. Uh, and I noticed that I knew that some of the Republicans weren't terribly happy with that. But, so I said, well, you know, we're reducing the size of the committee and we're going to, we're going to make sure that everybody doesn't have an overlap during the committee sessions. And so consequently, uh, we're not going to be able to do exactly as you say. We'll do as much as we can, but we can't. And they were not very happy. He was not very happy about that. But he finally says, yeah, well, you have the votes, okay. <laughs> so, so we did it. And one of the things that I did is I made sure that I had the votes for the coal tax on the taxation committee. 
And <laughs> when I added up the votes, and the people who had seniority, and people like Gordon McCumber, who was the president of the Senate, and, and uh, Dave Manning, and a whole bunch of other people who voted against me on all these coal tax bills, the coal tax bills every time I presented one, uh, I, I had quite a little uh, a problem. And I finally concluded that, that uh, Colstead, Colstead, Alan Colstead. Haver. From Haver that he was probably the, the least senior uh, there, and, and I, I had to replace him, or I wouldn't have the votes in that committee. And so I called Bob Brown. He was just newly elected to the Senate. He came with Dorothy and I at the House at the same time. And I finally located him. He was out in some, at some uh, seminar or something in Idaho, and I, I located him and I asked him if he would support uh, the coal tax at, at the price. Uh, I had it at 25% then, uh, and it was later became 30, but I asked him if he would support the coal tax. And he says, yeah, probably. I think I could do that. And I said, well, how would you like to serve? Uh, did, you like, did you like the committee assignments that Frank Hazelbaker made? He says, no, I really didn't. And I said, how would you like to be on the taxation committee? And he says, I haven't been in anything in taxation. I don't know anything about taxes. <laughs> I said, well, how would you like to be there? You should learn a lot. And, uh, and he said, oh, OK. So I appointed him. And uh, Alan Colstead, of course, hated me for the rest of his life. But that was OK. <laughs> I had the votes for the taxation committee. <laughs> so I guess I've gone on long enough. Uh, we should open it to questions. Part of it, by the way, uh, part of that too was a seating arrangement, and that was, there's some really interesting things there, and a few other things, but I'll stop right there and let people ask questions, if anybody has any. Was that Jack Devine? That sounds Yes, like Devine, Great Devine, Falls. that was Jack. Good, they, 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 you both are mainly, yeah, it was. Divine, yeah. <clears throat> totally, that name was gone from my head. <laughs> Divine. Well, he, he was better. <laughs> yeah, he he um, he was a pretty good Democrat, but he just was more business oriented and wasn't yeah, interested was, in. It's in just Biden. Great Falls. And he was in Great Falls, right? <laughs> you know, the Divine Motors. Yeah. No, Divine and Asselstein, uh, uh, beverage distributor. Dorothy, uh, your dad was an incredible influence, a great man. I. Never can forget going into your house and seeing the geology of the canyon in your fireplace. <laughs> okay, but can you explain how your dad's influence influenced your decisions early on in life? Oh, that's such a lovely question. <laughs> Thank you, Don. Don and my family had shared quite a bit, particularly when I was in high school when his dad was superintendent before he died way too young. You got Mike? Oh, yeah. Um, my family had huge conservation roots. My grandfather, Bradley, on the West Coast, had helped with some of the, the Muir people, found the Sierra Club, when it was an activist group. And it's morphed as everything else has. But so it was always in my life was conservation and when uh, I didn't see this really until I was in college but my father had done an article for science magazine that was published in 59 that's before I was even in high school that said the first resource that humans would run out of on this planet would be water and by the year 2000 it would compromise our standard of living and you know, I discovered that when I was in college, I read it again, and it caught my attention, along with Paul Ehrlich's population bomb and all the other things that we were reading then. And uh, I, I guess, and, and right about the time when I got out of college, my mother died, and my dad and I were very, very close friends, and he just kept supporting and supporting me with all the amusing things I was doing in Bozeman, <laughs> like 
running for office when I was 22. And uh, it was it, it was just a very much part of family history commitment. We camped all our lives, we canoed all our lives. I am among the lucky to have had such an amazing childhood, but it definitely set me on my path of activism. I moved to Montana in 1978, so I'm wondering if you could talk a little about the the fertile ground that was here, or how you how you made the ground fertile, so that all of these things could come together as they did. Well, I, go ahead. I think that uh, a lot of that is just what was happening in the state, and. Uh, we the environmentalists and there's a lot of stories from the environmentalists even earlier than the 70s uh, that you should read in here but uh, they were becoming very very vocal and very active uh, we had the uh, Democrat I mean the uh, Constitutional Convention and the Constitutional Convention was a big thing in Montana and because of that Constitutional Convention and how that developed, and it was a part of a part of the uh, uh, campaigning before the convention uh, uh, that was a part of that too, and and it ended up with a lot of people who were Democrats uh, elected to the Democrat uh, to the uh, Constitutional Convention, and and then all of those things came together, and in '75. It was a very great year for us young Turks. <laughs> we, I think, uh, did really well. Um, it used to be, up until at least about 1969, the uh, Placer Hotel. The Placer Hotel on the, was it the Fifth top floor. floor, seventh floor, Fifth. sixth floor? Fifth floor. Fifth floor of the Placer Hotel was all the Anaconda Company. They the watering all, hole. They always had food, they always had something to drink, they always had things there. Anybody that wanted to uh, relax during the session, any legislator was welcome. And, and not only did they in, exert their influence because of that, but they also, at that point, if you wanted to get a bill through the legislature, you probably better get some expertise to help you write it so it was written properly. And the only people who would do that was the Anaconda Company lawyers. And you found those on the top floor of the Placer Hotel. Well, that was out of style when we got, when Dorothy and I got there, I don't, I never went to the no, we, we developed a legislative council that was all new that wrote our legislation. And that made a huge difference. Yeah. And, uh, and not only that, but it, we weren't the type of people that would uh, be concerned about going to the lobbyist dinners <laughs> and to uh, take place. I always felt slightly cheated that the watering holes discontinued the year before I got there. <laughs> <laughs> um, the Con Fund has a wealth of lessons for us that we have never followed. Um, I think a lot of people don't realize that our Montana Constitution is the only constitution of this decade, or of this, not decade, this era that was passed. Other states gave it a try and nothing ever passed. Um, they did some things to purposely take the sting out of partisanship, like sitting alphabetically, like making even numbers on committees, like having the chair and vice chair from different parties right up at the top, like not bringing things out of a committee unless it was agreed on by everybody. And then, you know, because of that, once it was all over, they all went out and campaigned for it. There might have been maybe 10 delegates who opposed it, but the majority went out there door to door, county by county, and campaigned for their product. And it worked. And we have absolutely ignored every single one of those lessons about taking out the partisan sting. And it's because I think we've just decided we like it the way it is. Yeah, but the Constitution is pretty, pretty important itself. The Constitution was huge, huge, and it took about 
at least three sessions to implement the whole thing. Everything from equality of sexes to local government to environmental right of healthful environment to goodness. Right, privacy. Privacy, participation. Yeah. Clean and healthful environment. I, I, I think if I remember right, also I saw Bob Brown wrote this, if you're old enough to fight, you're old enough to vote. Mm -hmm. I remember lobbying on the floor myself for that as a college student. And I think that whole, the Vietnam and the, if you weren't of a certain age, you couldn't vote, but you could be sent off to war. And that, you know, all of that was a movement in the 70s yeah. that led to the turnover that allowed for the changes that happened in the legislature. Let me, add, let me add a little bit to that. That's exactly correct. Uh, there was a Democratic convention in Billings, Montana. And I, I, I can't give you the exact year, but it was just prior to the election, probably in 74, maybe 70, no, it wasn't 76, before that, maybe 72. At any rate, um, the uh, son of the law professor uh, came, I, I have trouble with his name now, but I'll think of it maybe, and he came to that convention as a student, and, and he urged that the Democratic Party adopt a platform position that 18-year-olds should have the right to vote. You had to be 21 at that time. And that was adopted. And in the legislature, I think we tried to get something going and didn't get anywhere, but uh, Mike Mansfield grabbed it. And he put it in to the National Congress and in the Senate of the United States. And uh, I think they originally started it at 19, and then they later got it down to 18. But he did it at 19, and it passed. So uh, a lot of what happened took place right here in Billings at a Democratic convention. Don, I'd love you to <laughs> offer some insights about how you think we can get back to constructive political times. You give it a lot of thought, and, and I give it a lot of thought, but is there something you see out there? Please. <laughs> yeah, we've got some uh, smaller problems. <laughs> get a new governor? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yes? Echoing that a little bit, it sounds like a lot of that, and I'm old, so I remember some from the 60s and things, although it was heated times, people seemed to have their positions and support them from where they were coming from. These days, and I just feel like sometimes people pull things out of the air, or you know, so many people look at Facebook as their source and that type of thing. And I just wonder how we could get back to people going back to, I can't think of the word, good arguments, not this kind of craziness does that make sense? Or? Yeah, it's uh, very much so. Uh, I would put it a little differently. It's civility. Okay. The, the concern uh, is, to me right now, is we've lost almost all of the civility we had. We were very decent to our opponents. Some of the, some of the people that I respected very much and the most were not Democrats, but Republicans. And we would argue and argue and argue on the floor mm -hmm. or in the committee. But we were good friends and we respected each other and we wanted to hear what they had to say. And now it's totally lost. It's just totally different. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're spending every waking moment, I think, trying to figure out how to get those other guys. That's wrong. Right. We might want to wind down in just a minute. Maybe one more thought or question. Tom and I would go on, you know, for another 10 hours. <laughs> well, thank you for writing. Oh, thank you for saying that. Yeah, it was my, it was my good fortune to do this. And as I saw the stories coming in, even the ones I had to edit, I just felt so lucky to be right in the middle of it. Yeah, it was a good thing to do. 
So in your own lives, think about when there should be a collection. I think it is a blooming shame that no one did this with the Constitutional Convention. And almost all the delegates are gone now. They should have had the personal stories, you know? So at least we did that. And, but we also set a precedent. It's a good way to go about collecting a, a, a historical insight. I, I think in particular it, it should shed a lot of light on just how the legislature, at least in the 70s, really operated mm -hmm. and, and how hard it was to get bills passed and what we had to do and, and how it worked. But it was also, it was also, Tom, as you showed, totally respectful of the process. I mean, you never would have thought of cheating the process. You beat the process. You know, you got to all your people over there in the Senate, and then you figured out how to control the committee on committees. I mean, it's just a wonderful story. But you never would have thought of just trying to flatten the whole process. We always loved the process. I've, I've in one of my recent reflections, I described the 70s as almost an immersion into public policy. I mean, we we're so into it. We just immersed ourselves into what we were doing. I hope other people can find a way to do that. It's so exciting. Let me give you one anecdote. Um, the, you know, I didn't win them all, <laughs> as you well know. And I made some mistakes also. And one mistake was uh, and dealt with the coal tax. Um, I was invited by the Accounting Association uh, of Montana to come to their annual bank, uh, annual meeting in Bozeman. And they said it was on a Saturday, so I should be able to do that and, and not miss any, leg any serious legislation. Well, we always met on a Saturday morning, but not generally too much significant legislation passed. And I checked everything, and there wasn't anything uh, significant in the coal tax bill. It didn't seem like it was close at all. So I didn't uh, didn't do anything. I mean, I said yes, I would take, I would do that, and I didn't ask to be excused or anything. Uh, and we went to Bozeman, and uh, Ruth brought the boys up, and we skied on Sunday, etc. And I got back on Monday, and guess what? <laughs> they uh, the House version of the coal tax bill came up even though it was not, I had asked the clerks about it, and they said, there's no way that'll get up here. It did. And, <laughs> and, and uh, uh, Bill Mathers. Bill Mathers. Bill Mathers uh, from Miles City, who was a principal opponent, my principal opponent uh, 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 in, on the coal tax bill. He, he was all for it, but not at 30%. And <laughs> so, when I got back, I found out that they, it had come up and it was on the floor. And Corny Thiessen, who was a good Democrat from uh, uh, from Sydney, well, from well, it's a little town, Lambert, uh, Ra Lambert was uh, a, a very concerned about the uh, coal for uh, the uh, the. Uh, no, the, 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 the well, they had the. <clears throat> MDU has a mine, and it's lignite coal, lignite coal, which is much less quality coal. And he wanted to make sure that they didn't, that we didn't hurt their coal mine. And so he moved that lignite coal be only treated at one third as much <laughs> as the regular, as the rest of the coal. And I opposed that, and I told him I opposed that, and he knew I opposed that, and, and Bill Mathers knew I opposed that. And, uh, but yet, they brought it up, and it went through, and Bill Mathers, and I was a good friend with Bill. I really had a lot of respect for Bill. Bill Mathers came up to me afterwards, and he says, you know, I suppose if you'd have been here, I wouldn't have got that through, would I? <laughs> I said, yes. But that is the law of today. <laughs> Late night coal pays only one third of what the rest of the coal has to pay. So we finally found one mistake Tom made. <laughs> I'm gonna think about that on the way home. <laughs> Thanks everyone. This is
so wonderful of you to show up and it was a joy to talk about those times. Thanks. Thank you, Mark.